uh, Jane Hayes. She couldn't be here today. But our second member will introduce uh, the remaining talks. Um, so I'm here to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the work that took place this summer um, in the computer science department. Um, so this is the computer science summer research program summary. So it's a summary of the summer. Um, so just big picture of sort of what took place um, over the summer. So um, Jane Hayes and I um, have done this once before, but we wanted to uh, basically provide a way for students that were interested in doing research to see other people that are doing research, um, practice giving their talks, um, keep up with what's going on, because we don't run the Keeping Current seminar over the summer. Um, and so we wanted to have something like that that was um, you know, sort of a little bit more social, because I think sometimes students that are working on research are sometimes isolated in labs, and thought it would be a good way to get people um, to come together. Um, so we set this thing up. Um, and so I looked back through, we had um, I think 11 or 12 students that ended up giving talks in the summer research program. There might have been a few more that were involved. Um, but this, you can see a list of the research topics that took place over the summer. So they ranged from um, medical imaging um, through bioinformatics, things about software engineering and virtual machines, so a wide range of different topics. Um, there were three main events for this uh, program. There was a introductory talk where people got up and they sort of said what they were going to work on, a midsummer progress update where everybody gave about a five minute talk saying sort of what they had accomplished so far, um, and then a final talk um, where you sort of summarized the you know, bulk of what you got done over the summer. Um, and what you're going to see later are three of those talks. So um, at the last minute, I um, begged them to come and give a talk. So basically what you'll see is three of our um, talks um, in their exact form that they were given over the summer. So some of them the might expect you to have a little bit of context from their previous talks, uh, but I think they're all still um, will, will make sense and be nice and coherent. Um, and we had some social events um, attached to that. Um, and the other thing that I think is somewhat interesting about this slide um, is that the icons there were automatically chosen by PowerPoint. Um, and so I, there's a design ideas button, and I was like, oh, let me just try it out for this because you know this is a new set of slides. And so I did that, and these are what they came up with. And so I want you to just sort of look at those as we go through. It gives you a little bit of a sense of the state of the art in natural language processing, right? So there's some system that's looking at the text there and deciding that's the image that goes with it, um, with enough confidence that Microsoft will put it in a piece of software. I thought that was interesting. Um, so this um, program was sponsored by our Industrial Partners Association. Um, so you can see a range of different companies um, that provide some um, funding so that they can, you know, we, we sort of learn from them about what industry is looking for and they provide, um, you know, we um, help them make connections to students. And in this setting, they were providing money so that we could buy pizza, um, but, um, which was a nice thing to have. Um, so then I thought I would throw out, um, so as you're sort of watching these talks and thinking about what some of the students were doing, you might imagine that you, you would be interested in doing something like this. Maybe not the specific research idea, but somehow getting involved in doing some research. Um, and so my first piece of advice is to seek out a mentor. Um, and I think you know, that might be somebody that you've taken a class with, that you, you, know, you really enjoyed their class, you enjoy their research area. Um, and so I would encourage you to seek that out. If you don't sort of know how to do that or are unsure about how to do that, feel free to talk to me and I can provide some advice. Um, but I think that's one of the key things is find um, a faculty mentor who's interested in an area that you're interested in um, and see if you can come up with some arrangement where they're willing to give you advice um, about what you're doing. Um, and I think a big part of that is having some research interests and some goals. I find like when students come to talk to me about this, they can tell me why they're interested in this research, like they really want to solve this real world problem, or they want to be able to have a paper to put on an application at some point in the future, or something like that. Um, have some sense of, of that, I think is really useful. Um, and then the sort of specific options are doing independent studies, so where you can do you know, a CS395 or a CS612 and get some credit for that, um, or there, there's potential for fund, funded or unfunded research positions, depending on, on how that all works out. Um, and I 
like that the Discuss um, came up with a nice icon that that was my favorite choice of theirs. Um, so we have three talks um, from the summer. Um, one of them is from Jack Jaquish. Uh, will be the first speaker talking about collecting and using Twitter data. I don't know what that hat signifies, um, but um, with Shamrock, I guess. Um, Sean Great estimating flight routes, that's an on-point icon. Um, and then Johan Long is going to be talking about a nuclei detection and segmentation. So a medical imaging, so somewhat appropriate to have icon that's chosen. Um, so now I'm going to step back. Uh, we're going to have these people give you know, five-minute talks. You're welcome to ask questions at the end of their talk, um, and then I'll have a little bit of more of an announcement after, after that. Jack Jakewish, and today I'm going to briefly go over the research that I did over the summer uh, under the advisement of Dr. Humphrey. And that took form in two uh, central things. The first is the majority of the summer I spent working on a piece of software uh, to collect social media data, in this case from Twitter. Um, and for the latter part of the summer, uh, I used that piece of software so we could collect some preliminary results. So uh, Twitter provides an API which lets you query things such as tweets and user information, etc. And Python has a library known as TweetPy, which lets you interact with the Twitter API in a much easier manner. What I wrote was a wrapper for this uh, TweetPy library so that we could collect the sort of data that we're interested in in a useful format uh, on a large scale and over a long period of time. Um, rather than talk about the features of the software, I'm going to talk about the output in the interest of time. Um, there were two distinct forms of output that my software produced. The first were maps of social connections between users. So maybe I'm following you, you're following them, who are they following, etc. And then the second are tweet objects, which contain things such as the body of text of a tweet, who tweeted it, and the time they tweeted it, but also an enormous amount of metadata about the tweet, such as geographic location, if it's available. Uh, and the focus today is just going to be on the tweet objects. So an example, uh, when we're trying to determine results from this, what we're looking at is to see if this Twitter data uh, is useful. And what we want to see is if we can get uh, sorts of information that either isn't necessarily available from other sources or get it from Twitter before it's available elsewhere. And an example of this would be traffic data. So maybe a Twitter user is stuck in traffic and they tweet something like, oh man, the traffic's awful on this street. And we want to see if we can get information from that before you could get it from another source like a traffic radio. So with traffic as our use case, um, we're going to look at using this to predict um, certain traffic events, and we're going to look at a set of data that we collected over a specific period of time in terms of the keywords that appear within, uh, the hashtags that appear within, and then a specific traffic event that occurred. Um, in terms of keyword frequency, so over the course of 16 hours, we collected only geographically enabled tweets from an area around New York City. There were just under 54,000 tweets total that we collected, and after doing some filtering for traffic-related terms, such as street names in the area, and you know, bad traffic, collision, things like that, we got roughly 8% of those had potential to be related uh, to our use case. Going on to hashtags, using the exact same set of data, um, we just looked at the hashtags, not at the body of the text. We 
see we had over 24,000 hashtag appearances within the 54,000 tweets. Uh, 11,390 of those were distinct. And after doing a very similar sort of filtering for traffic related terms like streets and, and such, we had just under 2,700 appearances and 199 distinct hashtags that we thought could be potentially related to traffic. And this is, uh, I'm gonna give you a visual of what those two sets look like. Here's the first. Uh, we can see in New York, they were talking about the Democratic debate. They were upset with Mitch McConnell and they were interested in the bachelorette finale. Now after doing the filtering I mentioned, we see a much broader spread of New York City, Yankees, different events, different streets, and different things like that. And this is a, a trivial case, but it's just to give you an idea of what that kind of data would look like. So moving on to our specific advance, uh, example, on July 30th, a crane uh, partially collapsed on FDR Drive in New York City and shut down the lanes going in either direction pretty much completely for a couple of hours. Uh, during this event, we collected over 200 tweets with the phrase crane collapse, just that phrase alone in them. And here we see the earliest internet news article that appeared about it at 3.57 p.m. that day. There's a headline. However, we see the first tweet that appeared about it that we were able to collect happened almost an hour earlier at 3.03 p.m. And that's just an example of how you might use this to predict something before you can get it from another source, such as news article, traffic, etc. So finally, um, for further work, we want to see if we can get some kind of a number and just how reliable is this data? How, like, how reliably can we use it to predict certain events? And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, that's something uh, I was thinking of that we didn't get around to implementing was just kind of looking at all hashtags that appear and, and sort of trying to say, oh wow, that's, there's a sudden spike in this, so maybe something's happening there, and throw that along for further analysis. So yeah, that's a good one. Any other questions? My name is Sean Gray, and over the, over the summer, I uh, was presented with this data set of Kentucky where it was mapped entirely with this thing called LIDAR, which I had no idea what it was. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about estimating flight routes. So to talk about the data, you basically just shoot a laser and it captures a bunch of points along some sort of scan. And then with that data, you also get a bunch of attributes like the position of the point, um, intensity, which I'll talk about later, um, how it was scanned with time, that kind of stuff. Um, so for example, you can visualize it as a point cloud, and so here's uh, like the edge of Louisville on the Ohio River, so you can see like the giant skyscrapers, or you can see, this one's a little bit harder to tell, but that red spot in the middle is the Capitol building in Frankfurt. Um, but as you view these tiles of data along uh, larger scales, you can notice these bands of intensity, which is just a way to color the point cloud, and the ranges of intensity don't really, they aren't consistent between larger regions, which is obviously a problem. So what we conjectured that kind of causes this, for the most part, is the scan angles. Basically, if you have your plane with the LiDAR sensor, it's the angle formed by the scan line and the nadir. Um, so then also, 
with the points, you can have points that have multiple returns. So if it goes through something kind of transparent like a tree, it'll hit a leaf, it'll go through the leaf again, and you'll automatically get two returns, and then finally it'll hit bare earth, and that'll be your final return. Um, so this gives you a lot of information about where the LiDAR sensor was if you filter these points by the points with multiple returns. Um, and so then once you kind of uh, estimate the scan angles, you might be able to do some sort of regression to figure out the position of the plane. And then finally, that should help with correcting the intensity values that were captured along the flight route. So uh, our overview of the approach we were taking is to estimate the flight route of the LiDAR sensor and then predict a scan line for every point, because not every point has multiple returns. Um, and then using that prediction to then estimate a scan angle and then finally correct um, the intensity based on that and learn some sort of function based on scan angle. So the first step is to reconstruct scan lines. So you find all the points with multiple returns and then you just compute some sort of normalized vector that points towards the flight route. So you can see if you do this approach, you actually get some pretty nice results, and as it turns, you'll see that they also kind of line up at an intersecting point, which kind of indicates where the flight route might have taken place. So the naive approach to do this is to do some sort of like pairwise distance matrix, and if you do that for all the points, you can find the closest points along two adjacent times, and you get an okay looking flight route, but you can see that there's still a lot of variability with it. So then what we want to do is get a better model. Um, so we can use the optim optimization library known as PyTorch and construct just a simple linear motion model um, represented as f of t, which is time, uh, equal to some matrix times t plus b, and where a is just your initial um, velocity and b is your initial position. And then what we're going to try to minimize is basically just the similarity between two scan lines. It's just represented as a dot product loss. So intuitively, if you have your ground truth vector, which we've computed as the scan lines, we're trying to predict another vector, and if that loss is too big, we're trying to minimize that, so we're trying to match the two vectors up so that they actually lie together. And doing this, we get an even better result that finds a linear model, and it, as the model, as the tile turns, you'll see that this line actually passes through the intersection point pretty well. Um, and then we have some future work that we're working on, like maybe trying to find a less restrictive motion model, so not assuming that the flight path is linear. Um, and then also maybe modeling uncertainty with the flight path, because we can't for sure know where the LiDAR sensor was. Um, and then just over the summer, there were some challenges of like learning the Linux environment and knowing when to stop with some ideas because you don't want to go off the deep end or like go too far into it if it's not going to lead anywhere. Um, and then I just wanted to thank Hunter Blanton, who was a graduate student I worked with, and Nathan Jacobs, who is my mentor, and also the NSF because they provided funding. point cloud with that, 
which has been shown to help with performance of some uh, neural networks and stuff like that. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm not really sure how LiDAR works, but is that banding just caused by the brightness of the time of day the scans are taken? So according, they have like a whole LiDAR specification collection report and in that they specify that it has to be like a cloudless day. Um, I think they also specify the time of day and stuff like that. So they do try to control for that. Okay. So which also led us to believe maybe it wasn't some sort of super outside factor. Hello, I'm Yuhan Long, and this summer I worked with NASCAR CNN for nuclear detection and segmentation of tissue images with the grass of Tony Young and Dr. Nathan Jacobs. So we have a pathology. In pathology, there's these large tissue samples that are large images with many, many nuclei in them. And annotating all of these nuclei can take a lot of time. Because this, but since these nuclei take, contain a lot of valuable informa information for a pathologist, it is very important to go get these data. But these, because the pathologists have to be the ones that annotate them, since they know exactly what they are, the annotations can be difficult to obtain, and there just aren't enough data overall. So for me, I use a data set from the Mikai 2018 Nuclear Segmentation Challenge. Uh, it contains these up by 1,000 tissue images with 500 to 1,000 nuclei on them. And I wanted to be able to train on these single cropped out nuclei to be able to predict other nuclei on the image to potentially get more information. So one thing I used here was the NASCAR CNN. It's an instant segmentation network that helps detect, that allows us to detect objects and determine exactly what part of that object is, pixel is part of that object. And I specifically used the torch vision implementation of NASCAR CNN inside Python. To get a grading of how, measurement of how well I was able to detect a tissue, the nuclei, I used an aggregate card index, which is just an intersection over union, except it adds all the intersections all the ends over separate nuclei by comparing each of them to each other, close to one. So for a method, what I did was I grabbed a tissue image, Randomly selected 25 tissues, assuming that these were what a pathologist annotated. So, cropped these out, and then annotated, aka transformed these images to potentially get more data, and then get predict. Of course, here there wasn't really much prediction. This was without any augmentation, no transformations at all in the original crop nuclei. But when I, crop, when I annotated, augmented the nuclei, I was able to get quite a bit better result with a decent amount of annotations, especially there's quite a few that were clearly not in the original sample. Then the AJI you can see also increases with the better detection, so we know that at least it has some value. So for our results, we can see that with the plots, we have the y-axis as the aggregate card index versus the x-axis, which is an annotated nuclei. This is for no augmentations at all. Each color is just a different random sample of nuclei. And we can see that the detection goes up to about 20%, but it has a bit of variability. And then when we add augmentations, it pretty much monitor augmentation goes up, and then we have better detection overall. So it's still a bit wary of how well it actually is. Another thing we can keep note here is the fact that the, just because we have more nuclei put into the image doesn't necessarily give us a better result on the detection. And other more qualitative results, we can see that the detection is quality, the detection occur but vary in quality. For the ground truth on the left, that's the original annotations, but with the prediction on the right, you can see that there's, it catches a lot of the annotations, but it still misses a few of them too. 
But some challenges I had while working with this was the images tend to be resized for MassRCN to help with convergence. convergence. But this makes it detect the whole image and makes the whole thing into a single nuclei when it clearly isn't. And there's also some issues with detections that are not correct, as in the bottom, on the right image, you can see there's just this box right there. Not quite sure how it works, but it goes away after a longer training period. So some of those things that I can do is we can potentially more fine tune the code a bit more to potentially give better results. And another thing we check is to see exactly how the position of nuclei, what you wish nuclei to choose, changes how detection occurs. I would like to thank Dr. Nathan Jacobs for giving this talk to me and Tony Young for helping me throughout this project. They want to go to annotate the image, but right now data is just there's just a lack of data. So being able to get more data by using this research, we can just get more data so we can train better neural networks. And with that new neural network, we can potentially allow pathologists to help diagnose diseases and stuff like that. Because that's what these tissue images are used for. summary of basically what took place this summer. We had quite a few uh, students working with different faculty members. Um, and yeah, so maybe we'll give um, one more round of applause to our speakers. Um, and with that, I am done. What's your algorithm for building the puzzle? So, what do you start with? Give it a Sudoku puzzle with less than 17 cells to So, I start with a grid. Randomly put 17 or fewer numbers in that grid. Now, it could be that there's no solution because there's a conflict immediately, like two nines on the same row. Um, and so, it might say there's no solution. does give you a solution. Let's say it says there, there's more than one solution. Here's, here's a solution. Right, now, now, so there, now you have a solution, but what's the puzzle? It said, given your initial configuration, 
There were many solutions. Here's one. That's not yet a puzzle. Yeah. Do we know how many solutions? How many there are? No, you're just told that there's more than one. Okay. That's, that's in the right direction, but I want to make sure everyone hears it. Start with a completely empty grid. Ask for a solution. Well, clearly there's lots of solutions. I think it's been estimated at three zillion. All right, so you've got a lot of solutions. It gave you one of them. Now what? So you said the random number from one of those, from one of them, 81. There's 81 cells. There's like one random cell. That well, you take a random cell. And when you use that, and you blank it out. Okay, and then why? Then we put it back in. And then, and then you, you give that to the, to the uh, flat box. And it says, yes, there's one solution. All right, now what? Now we select two. All right, so now you select the one you've already taken and another one. And you keep taking random ones, blanking them, until at some point it says, no, there's multiple solutions. Then what? You can repeat it until there's only one solution. But there was only one solution at the very beginning. When I just blanked one cell, there was only one solution. I don't want to stop there. But you got the right idea. So I'm going to just tell you the rest of it because we're out of time. So yeah, you, 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 you randomly blank cells until you get a position where it says there's more than one solution. The one you just blanked, put that one in and color it red. You've got to keep that. And so you keep looking at all the 81 cells in random order. But any one that, if you blank it, leads you to multiple solutions, you turn that one to a red one and you keep it. And when you're finished, when you've looked at all 81, some of those are red and those you've got. That is now a puzzle. And it has exactly one solution. It might be hard, it might not be, but that's, that's what I do. You can look on my uh, website and you can see that every day I publish a new Sudoku puzzle. And that's the method I use. Now, what is the black box? That's for another talk. See you next week. Yeah.